Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Mesa Mayor Scott Smith makes it official he is running for governor. We'll hear about a lawsuit filed against Arizona's law restricting same-sex marriage. And ADOT will join us for an update on Valley Freeway construction. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Mesa Mayor Scott Smith today announced that he is running for governor, a move that changes the dynamics of an already crowded field of Republican candidates. Here to talk about those dynamics is political consultant Jay Thorne. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Uh, surprised at this uh, announcement at all? Well, there was some on again, off again speculation about this. Uh, and as Ducey spent most of last year raising uh, a great deal of money, there was speculation that Mayor Smith may decide not to run. Uh, but it wasn't really a surprise that he decided to. He's well positioned. He's a little bit probably more to the center than some of the candidates who are out there uh, right now. He has a very different kind of resume. Uh, so uh, not really a surprise, but, uh, but a little bit perhaps. Who is Scott Smith? Talk about his resume. Yeah, well, he has been a very successful mayor uh, for the third largest city in the state of Arizona, Mesa. Um, he has been bullish on economic development. Uh, he has been uh, moderate and has been a supporter of Governor Brewer uh, on things like Proposition 100, which uh, raised taxes for a short period of time, and on uh, the Medicaid uh, package that some Republicans opposed last year. He was there standing next to her, supporting her on that. Uh, but he has uh, rebuilt and, and he would say put the swagger back into the city of Mesa has done an extraordinary job there with economic development. He's been a strong proponent of solar energy. Um, so some things that are maybe a little more centrist than, than some of the Republicans that are in the race now. So as far as the conservative moderate scale, he's, he, as you say, fits a little bit more to the center than any or all of those candidates? Uh, I, I would say probably all. Um, and it's a function in part of being a mayor. Uh, being a mayor is just a different kind of job than being state treasurer uh, or secretary of state or a member of the legislature. You have uh, budgets to meet that you are, as the CEO of your city, uh, responsible for. There's a, a different position of, of where the, being where the rubber meets the road as mayor. And so when you say centrist, it, it, it really is a reflection of having to be more pragmatic uh, in his role as mayor. I think he would say, and many would say, that he's very conservative. So does, is that his main, is that what he offers as far as a difference to the other candidates? That's part of it. I think he, he would probably tell us that you know he has a different perspective that he has a, a level of energy and enthusiasm and uh, not state government thinking that he brings to the equation that makes him a different kind of candidate where will his support come from well, he, he should be strong in the East Valley. I mean, obviously, as I said, Mesa, third largest mm -hmm. city in, in the state. He should be he should be strong there. Um, Again, I don't think he's going to concede the conservative wing of the Republican Party by any stretch. The most popular Republican, I would argue, in the state today is Governor Brewer. Uh, and what she decides to do, whether she decides to weigh in, may have some bearing on this. And as I said, he's been a, a pretty staunch supporter of hers. And let's not forget that there still is this small percentage chance that she ends up in the race, because I'm not entirely sure she's given up that prospect herself. Well, let, let's say that she... She does not jump in. I, I have a funny feeling that he said he had talked to the governor a little bit here beforehand, so it would be surprise me a little bit if she were to go ahead. That would be a surprise. Yes, yes. in a variety of ways. Yep. Can he win a Republican primary? Yeah, I think he can win a Republican primary. Um, it's in a, in a race that is as divided as with as many candidates as that one has today, and I'm not sure all of those candidates will be there by the time we get to mm -hmm. July. Uh, it's about identifying your supporters and turning them out. It becomes a turnout game. And so he might be trying to expand some of the typical off presidential year Republican primary base voters, uh, but I do think he has a chance to win. With that in mind, can he rally the troops? If, if it is a tough primary and he does win, does he have enough, do you think, in the Republican circles to rally the troops in the general? Absolutely. I think, you know, as we as we play with these scenarios, sure. if he were to emerge from that primary, I think Republicans would rally around him rather strongly. If, on the other hand, he makes it close but fails and it becomes a center versus right debate within that primary, that may end up helping what is now the lone Democrat in the race, Fred Duval. 
If Scott Smith were to win that Republican primary, though, I think he'd be a very, very formidable candidate in a general election. I was going to say, in a general versus Fred Duvall, um, would he be more formidable maybe than those who lean harder right? He, he would probably have a, a, a better chance of reaching independent and moderate Republican voters, but it really depends on what the tone and tenor of the Republican primary turns yeah. out to be. And we don't know what that looks like yet. Compare a, a Scott Smith with a Fred Duvall, because some see some similarities there, and others say, no, 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 they're, they're very different. What do you see? Uh, they're, they're very different. Um, Fred is, uh, he has a track record of experience in government. Uh, he worked for, I mean, we've elected two Democrats in Arizona as governor in the last 30 years, Bruce Babbitt, Janet Napolitano. He worked for, for Babbitt, and it was a very professional, successful administration that was very bipartisan. Uh, he went on to work in Washington, served as a regent. He has uh, some experience in government, but more experience really outside of it. Scott Smith, again, as being a, a mayor of a city, third largest city in the state of Arizona, uh, has been responsible for um, everything from the streets getting repaired to jobs to uh, uh, education with, within the city of Mesa. He's been, I think, bipartisan in his approach to things. He's, he's been a very happy, gregarious, charming fellow who's gotten along with everyone. So I think that race would be maybe more congenial than some of the yes. other lineups might be, but I think it would be close and I think it would be interesting and I think the state would be really well served by it. Our debate wouldn't be quite as much fun if those two I, you know, I think it wouldn't be as vicious, but it probably would be <laughs> it would probably equally fun. Last question. They talk about state recognition and people like a Doug Ducey who holds state office, Ken Bennett who holds state office, that that really does help because your name has been out there throughout the entire state. Obviously, Scott Smith very focused in Mesa. Does that really make that much of a difference? I think it makes a little bit of difference, and I think it makes it certainly makes somewhat of a difference in a primary. Um, Doug Ducey's traveled around the state, and he's been on the ballot in every single county in the state. Scott Smith has not. Doug Ducey has spent the last year raising money and has a million dollars in the bank. Scott Smith's just getting started. And I, so I, I do think it makes somewhat of a difference, probably more about organization and structure than just name ID. Yeah. All right, Jay, good stuff. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Earlier this week, a class action lawsuit was filed by four Arizona same-sex couples who claim that the state's ban on same-sex marriages is unconstitutional. Sean Aiken is the attorney for the plaintiffs and attorney at least. Are you the lone attorney or are there others involved? My daughter is co-counsel Ellen Aiken and associates from my office, Heather All McCree right. and Will Knight. All right, so. good enough. So you are very much involved. It's good to have you here. Thanks. Thank I would have you. liked to have gotten into debate, but it's kind of hard to find some folks on the other side as yet. They're still kind of formulating whatever. That being said, what's going on here? What, what's, what's the relief petitioned here? The relief is for an injunction against all the laws that discriminate against same-sex couples and keep them from getting either married here or having their uh, valid out-of-state marriages recognized. And these are four couples? These are Arizona couples? Yes, there are four Arizona couples, uh, three in Maricopa County and one in Pinal County, and, yes, longtime and, residents. And these are longtime residents, but were they married in other states? Two were, two were not. The two who were, were married in California in 2008, yes. And again, I understand the Supreme Court ruling on federal benefits is, is a big factor here. Talk about that ruling, talk about how it factors what you're trying to do. That ruling came down in June of last year. It's called United States versus Windsor. And in the Windsor case, the U.S. Supreme Court struck the Defense of Marriage Act provision that 
banned federal benefits to same-sex couples. Uh, and our argument here is that for the same reason the federal government could not ban, uh, uh, could not prohibit couples from receiving those benefits and ban marriage uh, between same-sex couples, so too the state cannot do that. And so we're asking for an extension, really, of the Windsor ruling is the way to look at it. Okay, and this Arizona not the only state going this route, correct? Arizona is one of 32 states that currently bans same-sex marriage, and I am aware of cases in about half of those that are challenging those laws. So we're about number 15 or 16. <sighs> Critics uh, of the move will say that the, the voters of Arizona did amend the Arizona Constitution to include the definition of marriage being of a man and a woman. Right. Um, done by the voters, Constitution amended. We can get into the court cases afterward here in a second or so. Mm -hmm. But how do you respond to folks who say, you know, this has already been addressed and the people have spoken? Well, first of all, the people spoke in 2008. That was before Windsor. And secondly, Ted, it's never been the law in the United States that voters can pass discriminatory propositions. So uh, the fact that the voters of Arizona said or did uh, what they did in 2008 doesn't make it any more defensible than what the legislature did in the late 1990s. So I understand the point, but the amendment doesn't make it any more defensible. Talk about the Court of Appeals ruling, though, in, in 2003, which seemed to uphold the definition, and it seemed to say that lawmakers can decide that it, it is in the state's best interest to keep marriage to a man and a woman. How does that factor into all this? Well, that was a 2003 case, Stanhart. That was a very narrow ruling. Mm -hmm. We don't need to get into the legal weeds on it, except to say that it came before the state constitutional amendment. It came before Windsor, and it's not an important consideration for us in our case. We're looking solely at the laws, the statutes, and the state constitutional provision only. If, if, and again, from the other side, the critics will say, if you are looking only at statute, why not go to the legislature? Why not get the voters to address this again? Because it's been done in other states, and in other states, sometimes it succeeds. Because my clients are suffering. And without some relief from a court, the legislature is not going to act. Right now, the Tenth Circuit, is the Tenth Circuit taking up the Utah case? Is that, is that correct? The Tenth Circuit is receiving briefs in the Utah case. Talk about the Utah case real quickly. You bet. The Utah case is very similar to ours. It's in federal district court. Judge Robert Shelby struck Utah's ban on same-sex marriage, and that's now on appeal to the Tenth Circuit. He decided that in December. Briefs will be done in February, and the decision will follow, I would think, in the spring. Again, the question, why not wait for that decision? Well, two reasons. One is the Tenth Circuit could reverse. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, what happens in the Tenth Circuit doesn't govern here in the Ninth Circuit where Arizona is in any event. So I have clients who are looking for relief and looking for an answer. And so we're in court here in Arizona. Does it seem as though, regardless of where it goes, the avenues taken, this is going to wind up in the, Supreme, the U.S. Supreme Court? I, I don't think there's any question about it. All the authorities, people who know this issue a lot better than I do, agree that sooner or later the Supreme Court is going to have to resolve this issue, namely, how will state legislatures and voters in the states uh, be allowed to to treat this issue. Yes. And I, I mentioned earlier the idea of going to the legislature, and some would scoff at that idea, but the, the fact is it is an option. I, is that even a consideration as far as folks who, same-sex married couples, who, who are looking for relief, but looking for relief perhaps outside of the courts? Well, it's certainly an option, and I'm probably not the most informed member of the community on that question. I do know uh, in getting ready to file this lawsuit that the question has come up in the Arizona Senate the last two sessions. I think Senator Gallardo, I believe it was, the last session had uh, a proposal. But it gets nowhere, and so the question is, why wait? And so what is the timetable now for your suit? We expect responses from the defendants of one stripe or another in February. And for reasons that will be beyond my control, namely, a very good judge 
and very able defendants. I can't say for sure how long will it'll be to resolution. I hope in 2014. The Utah case was 10 months. Yeah. Complaint to result March to December. So. All right. And again, as far as the 10th Circuit is concerned, you're saying 9th Circuit obviously is independent of the 10th, but um, you do get an indication, you do get a hint, you do get a suggestion of where this thing is headed. I think that the law is changing in my client's favor. There's no question about it. And the Utah case is an indication of it. Yes. All right. Sean, it's good to have you here. Thanks Ted, for very joining. Good to be here. Appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. The Phoenix area's freeway system continues to grow. Here to give us an update on current and future projects is Rob Samore, the Senior Deputy State Engineer for the Arizona Department of Transportation. Good to see you again. Thank you. Good to be back. Uh, freeway openings last year. W what did we see out there? So we had the opportunity to make a lot of progress on the 303. So there were a number of projects, six in the corridor, of which we've now completed four of those projects. And motorists are able to enjoy those new widened lanes with the quieter asphalt pavement, uh, rubberized asphalt pavement on the 303. Okay, and before we get to what's uh, you know, the, the particulars here, compare 2013 with what we expect in 2014. So in 2014, we'll continue uh, construction on those remaining sections of the 303, but we'll also see some groundbreaking on some bigger projects around the valley, which will continue to help motorists with their daily commutes. Let me throw some things out here. The Loop 101, the Awa Freya Freeway, this is the, an HOV ramp from Bethany Home to uh, Glendale. Talk to us about that project. So uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a partnership between MAG, Maricopa Association of Governments, ADOT, and Glendale, certainly interest in additional access to the stadium. And so we put out a project in advance of the 2015 Super Bowl to construct HOV connectors to the existing Maryland Road interchange. Um, that is a unique interchange because, or bridge, it, because it services just the HOV or that center high occupancy mm -hmm. vehicle lane. And it'll allow greater access in and around the, the venue at the sports arena. Completion date again? We should be done sometime in this summer, well in advance of the football season. Are traffic restrictions? I'm not out there as often as I used to be. I'm not a Cardinal season ticket holder anymore. Uh, uh, traffic uh, problems out there, uh, restrictions? Interestingly enough, the HOV construction generally occurs only in the median, gotcha. and so our contractor has found a unique way to limit any disruptions to the main line. Uh, there might be some interruption of the HOV lane itself. There's a widening project on the 101 in the East Valley. It looks like it's from uh, Shea all the way up to the 202. I think we have a map of that as well. Here we go. Uh, what's going on with this one? So I, uh, the, the map will show from Shea Boulevard down to the Loop 202 Red Mountain Freeway. We're going to add a general purpose lane to the outside. Construction should probably start sometime late this summer. Uh, we'll advertise for contractors late this spring. It'll essentially add about 10 miles of general purpose lane or one additional lane in each direction through that corridor. Now, uh, that's southbound, but northbound, is it the same road or is it a little bit higher up there? I thought I saw McKellops as opposed to the 202. Uh, and, and McKellops 202, just using general yes, yes. Uh, uh, cross streets, uh, it will be McKellops north to Shea Boulevard. So both sides of that 101, which is already just a massive free, that's going to get one more lane, huh? That's correct. Now, what kind of restrictions will we in place then? Motorists shouldn't see any reduced capacity in terms of lanes. There may be restrictions to set up barrier and, and other safety appurtenances to allow our contractor to work to the outside. Mm -hmm. But in general, we'll try to keep the same number of lanes through construction, maybe just restrict them in their overall width. 
and timeline, what are we talking about here? I, I would say that project probably has a 15 months to maybe two year duration. Um, if we advertise this spring, contractor starts in the summer of 14, we should see completion by early 16. Okay, so starting this summer. That's correct. Keep an eye. Okay, uh, the 303 um, from I-10, it looks like the, from the map again, from I-10 to maybe just short of Grand Avenue. Explain what's going on here. Right, so what your viewers are seeing are a number of segments, um, some that are completed, some that are, are still under construction. We had a total of six projects in that corridor that started as far back as about 2008. We've now completed four of those. The remaining projects uh, to complete are the system interchange at I-10, and there will be a section from Camelback to Glendale that'll open here very quickly this spring. So we've invested approximately uh, $500 million in that corridor for construction. Landscape projects will follow in behind, similar to mo most of the freeways in the valley. We landscape them with granite and mm -hmm. some sort of desert landscape. And so motorists towards the end of this year will actually have the full six lane divided freeway all the way down to 10 with connectivity to the interstate. So that corridor will be complete up to Grand Avenue. It's, it looks as though maybe I-17 to Happy Valley, is that completed? Is that, that's a done deal? So I-17 uh, in, in North Phoenix to Happy Valley in Peoria did receive its initial two lanes in each direction, so four lane divided, and it is complete as far as the current program goes. That would leave the section essentially from Happy Valley down to US-60 with a number of projects, and you mentioned projects to break ground, that will break ground in 2014. And this is, I think this is the map you're talking about, Happy Valley down to uh, Grand Avenue. Um, again, when is, when, what, give me the timeline again on that one again. So there's a total of three projects in that corridor. There's the interchange itself at US 60 and, right. and 303. There is the main line construction from US 60 up to Happy Valley, both in Peoria. And then there's going to be an interchange that's not shown on your map at El Mirage, and that'll be a standalone project. All three of those projects are in either design or will be under construction in this year. All right, so those, uh, prepare for those. That's Get correct, ready for and those. they represent about $130 million of additional investment above what's been put in the 303. Speaking of prepare, what is going on with the South Mountain Freeway? Where are we with that? So the study team went out in May to public hearing right here in downtown Phoenix. We had a public comment period through the summer we received an upwards, I believe, of 8,000 public comments. And so for the last six months or so, the team's been responding to public comments on the 303. Along with those comments, we've revised what was called the draft environmental impact statement to include the comments, the revisions to the, the draft for a final. That will be submitted for additional review with our federal partners. The public will have one more opportunity to comment on that, and then we will submit it to our FHWA partners for final approval towards the latter half of this summer. We call that a record of decision. Okay, record of decision, latter half of this summer, then what? If the record of decision is favorable towards the preferred alignment, it would mean that we could begin final design. The current options in the study are a no build, which many people have heard of, mm -hmm. and the preferred alignment on Pecos Road. If the preferred alignment is the choice, then what? Then what kind of timeline? Then we would start our final design. Some projects will go quicker than other. We have a number of mechanisms to put projects on the street. Traditional design bid build, which we design it and then we advertise it. Design build, which allows us to partner with a contractor and design and, and the construction happens simultaneously. And then there's a couple of other alternative deliveries that we could choose from. With that said, we would look to start programming those projects out over the next five years. Currently, the design shows nine segments. We may be able to consolidate some of those mm -hmm. to expedite construction. All right, before we let you go, I understand that the Highway 24 out there in the Southeast Valley, that's got a connector to the 202. Is that happening? Is it a Yes, the 24 is almost complete. Should see that late spring. That'll give uh, East Valley motorists access to Ellsworth. It'll allow for additional uh, improvements at the Mesa Gateway Airport and help with the overall regional connectivity for multimodal airport to system interchange. All right, very busy times. Good to have you here. Thanks Thank for you. the update. Thanks for having me again. It.
Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists' Roundtable. We'll have more on how the candidacy of Mesa Mayor Scott Smith will shake up the governor's race, and we'll discuss what the current governor is expected to emphasize in Monday's State of the State Address. Those stories and more Friday on the Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.